answered right away. Um, and that's really helpful because now as I'm starting to get more serious into my training, like I'm noticing little quirks with my body, like, okay, this left hip is tight. How do I work on that? Oh, here's mobility exercises to help with that. Oh, I'm not sure how many calories I should eat. Oh, talk to Elizabeth, you know, yeah. so it feels more. All right. We Welcome on? guys, we are back. And I am super, super excited because this guy's back in town. I had to do the last two weeks by myself. I shouldn't say that. Elizabeth was with me last week and uh, and Jessica was with me the week before, but I was in my house by myself. Scrambling and with scrambling. all the technology. All of these things. We just went through another little technical thing with the headphones a second ago. We're a little, we're a little belated trying to get our, our headphones connected the right way, but anyway. But I do have my smoothie this time. I had to drink water last time. It was. Oh, man. I know. There you go. Thank you. Delicious. The smoothies are are you know they've tasty. they've taken an uptake on the taste ever since like we met have. Elise Kopecky. Hmm. You know, and she gave me a hard time about. You know what blew me favorite. away about Elise was that she could taste like the garlic, the remnants of the garlic and onion yes. that you might have previously used on the same cutting, cutting board. board. Same cutting board. Yeah, I don't have that blend into the too. smoothie. I yeah. do not either. I was like, okay. It's good because my, my, my cooking is, is much more palatable the way that we did. <laughs> so guys, today we have um, a, spre uh, a special guest. Yeah. Brad Stolberg is the author uh, or co-author of, uh, of Peak Performance with Steve Magnus, who actually went to Rice and ran on uh, on my, my track team. And he's um, now the main coach for the University of Houston. Houston. Yep. Uh, and he has been kind of moving and shaking in the yeah, the and, and Brad world. too. So 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 we're we're super uh, excited to have um, you know Brad on. Brad is also uh, a longtime contributor to Outside, Outside Magazine. Magazine yep. uh, it's funny actually. One of our members, or Edward, um, just uh, basically shared one of his articles that we'll oh, talk right. about today. It's it's okay it's okay to be good, not great. So I'm really excited to talk about that with Brad. Um, yeah. And we're like, oh, we're having this guy on the show today. So yep. super fun. And also just a, a friend through Mario, Brad and I got to go um, running together. We did like a dude's uh, run weekend uh, last fall, about a year ago. It was a dude's run right weekend. <laughs> I was not invited. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah. Where were you? Where I were was you? not there, that's where I was. <laughs> I was not. I was not at that event. I was not invited, and I'm not bitter about it either. No, not bitter at all. Yeah. Not bitter at all. Well, let's uh, chime in with a few of you guys. Um, one Seamus, hello from Chicago, Chi Town representing South Side. What's up, Shayna? Uh, good to be back, Kyle. What's going on, uh, Lena? Um, hey from Bama. Hey, Lena. I was just in uh, Tennessee for a week. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you just said that because Alabama and Tennessee are pretty much the same. They're right next to each other. I was actually <laughs> in Chattanooga, which was very, very south, and we were right on the border okay, of fair. Alabama. Yeah. People, so people around. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, and people are often be like, oh, man, you're from Louisville? I've been to Tennessee before. Mm, I know. Yeah. I don't know. It's, They're all it's different. rough. We got the, oh, you poor. See this? Yeah. Smallest. Yeah. Smallest violin. Troy Salisbury's <laughs> here. How's it going, man? Uh, Jenna Kins, hey Jenna, from Dallas. Jenna. In. Awesome. Uh, Kyle, did your mom go to Muscle and Burger Bar? That is a good question. I asked on the show, um, you know, what the best burger place in in uh, Louisville was, and that's what I. I'll have to ask her. Actually, I didn't follow up. Mm. I'll let you know next time. Yeah. Um, so, what are you hoping to before we get Brad on here? Yeah, we'll have a little chat. What are you hoping to to learn from Brad today? So, I read Brad's book on peak performance, and I think what's really interesting about Brad is he has really take he's taken a like a real critical look at a lot of like the common things that we hear about running performance, right, uh, or, or about performance in general. And he's really done a lot of research on, on whether it's true mm -hmm. and asked a lot of experts. So he just has this great point of view to bring in um, that can really help us out. Because a lot of times, like, you know, people say stuff and you hear something enough times and then it sounds like it's a truth. Right. But way back when, we're all referencing this circle of no one who actually really knows. Yep. 
Um, I am most curious, you know, Brad on a couple of his uh, more recent articles yeah. uh, this year has touched on mental health and uh, has referenced a couple uh, meditation teachers that I'm familiar with. And so I am curious um, where that comes from in his personal life. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm very, very, I mean, we talk about, you know, we're running a running company and we talk about health. And when you talk about health, um, one of the things that is has you know come into my focus in my personal life is how much I cannot separate my my mental health and my mental ability versus uh, with my physical health. Yeah, agreed. And and I think that that was you know back when when I you know was in school and life was pretty much the same as all the people around me. I, you know I didn't really yeah. differentiate that much. You know I also think what's interesting too, <laughs> especially in this day and age, for those of us who do care about performing better as runners. We can't put our run performance in this box mm -hmm. and be a total train wreck in other areas of our life, right? Like it, they, they're they so connected in so many ways. So I'm also excited to talk to Brad about that. Like, yeah. you know, the advent of fitness trackers. Both of us are wearing our aura rings right now. Um, we are business married, as I like to say. <laughs> I never thought about that. <laughs> this is my real life and this is my business life. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, like, does this stuff make us better? What yeah. can we focus on instead? Yep. Um, before we get him on the phone, guys, a few other fun announcements. Uh, some of you guys are chiming in about New York. There's a Gleam link below. You get well, uh, that. signed up for a uh, drawing, uh, one of two free books from Brad. You didn't even hear me say New York, did you? I did. I thought that's what you were going to say. Well, I was going to get there. Oh, I was first okay. going to talk about us being in New York. Oh, that's right. That's and right. then oh, gosh, I was going to clean. He was excited to share. I so excited. <laughs> I was uh, so excited to have a partner on the show. I know. I we're back, we're back in the mix. We're back. Um, both of us are going to be in New York next week for the New York City Marathon. Yes. Really excited to be there. We'll be around Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We are going to be broadcasting uh, the marathon live on Sunday. Where and should we go? As we said, what mile should we be at? That is yeah. the question. We have an idea where we want to be. We'd love to hear your opinion. And uh, we will be getting our details together soon mm -hmm. and inviting you guys to come watch the race with us yep. as we do a little live commentating and broadcasting, which yeah. will be super fun. And we'll be there at the expo. If anybody's in the area, even if you're not running the race, uh, come hang out with us at the expo. Yes. We'll be out and about. And, and you know, honestly, our, our primary objective is to meet with you guys. So totally. if, uh, if you're watching this and you're anywhere in the New York area, want to come by, have lunch with us, yep. chill out, uh, check out that. some of the boots at the expo. We I'm also dropping this link in here. This Sunday, we are starting our final live 30-day challenge of the year. year. Nice. Always a highlight for our community. Love it. Um, we have athletes from all over the world signed up who are going through uh, all of our programs together. Yep. Either the Healthy Habits Nutrition or our 30-day challenge. We'll all kick off on Sunday with that initial test workout. And that's a good way to you know carry through November yeah. and uh, go into the uh, holidays Feeling strong. And I'm excited, you know, we have done a bunch more uh, in-person things this year, this year and last year, you know, coming to the major races and stuff. And I'm interested to see what, what we cook up for next year in terms of in-person stuff and how we can meet up with you guys more often um, or like, you know, host an event or a camp or something like that that, you know. I know. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're moving and shaking. We have a team now that is kind of cranking along and we're, we're looking at expanding. I'm all year. rested and energized. Ah. Uh, from my time in the Smoky Mountains, which we'll, I'm sure, get to later. But uh, should we get should we get Brad on the phone? Let's do it. Let's do it. Hold on. Let's Let me get Brad on the can, horn. Uh, what is the probability I get this right the first time? That's what I want to know. I think it'll be pretty good. I got faith. Um, Edward says, welcome from the salmon capital of the world. Uh, one Simus says, I agree. Running, exercise, diet, mental stability, all connects. The force of Dean Runner. Hey, guys. What's up, my man? Um... Dolph says, hey guys, such excellent content. Thank you. And we got Melomia coming in from Canada. What's up, Ma? Watch Brad does the blank. Does that <laughs> Brad, Brad, Brad is not, is not online. online. Well, that's... We just talked to Brad, so we'll see if we I can. I think Brad is online. That's what I think. Let's see. Oh, here, here we go. go. He wants to call me. I see how it goes. All right. All right. Brad, we are we are live. Let's make hey, sure that you guys the... hear me all right. Yeah, we can so hear you all right. Good. Now, the real question is, can our audience hear you all right? Yeah. And I think they can. OK. 
Can uh, you guys if you guys hear... can't hear Brad, you Brad. have to say something. First, we'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, but we, we've been talking about the things that we want to learn from this hour with you. And, uh, and yeah, we're just anxious to get started. Um, we have a bunch of people online that are... Just so Brad can see us, so it's not totally creepy. Oh, there He's we not go. Like staring. Yeah. At <laughs> no worries. <laughs> the we're, side of our face. We're gonna be we're gonna be facing here, but Guys, um, I'm, yes. I'm getting some echo on the YouTube, so I gotta close the YouTube. Yeah. But now we're better. So if you could just call us the question. Yeah, no problem. So so you know, one, we have a, an audience that will be asking us questions. So you guys who are tuning in, if you have questions for Brad as you get started, put them down below. We will try to get to as many as we can. Um, do you want to start with your? Set of questions, or because yeah. I, I have my own stuff that I, I'm curious about. Yeah, I, you know, was scrolling through your uh, Twitter feed a little bit, Brad, and I was just pulling some quotes that I thought were kind of interesting, and I thought there's some places that we could we could start. Um, one that I really liked was uh, was this one. Uh, two key abilities are pushing forward when you don't want to, and holding back when you want to push forward. Wisdom is knowing which one makes sense. Um, where were you at, or what inspired you to, to write that and, and post that when you did? You know, I've tried to, I've tried to take a very kind of free-spirited approach to Twitter. Um, I go back and forth between scheduling posts and treating it like this is a part of my job, this is how I communicate with my audience, to when a thought pops into my mind, I'm not going to think twice and just kind of rattle it off into the universe, uh, that fell into the ladder. And I think it's just from probably at that point in time, realizing my chronic failure at that, um, <laughs> being like, oh, like this is, a, this is like a nice way to synthesize how I often fail. Um, I think that I often probably push too hard when I shouldn't be and then don't push hard enough when I should in certain things. Um, yeah. And I, I wish that there was a fast track uh, to learn how to differentiate, but I think you know my definition of wisdom is that it's, uh, it's knowledge that kind of gets translated into experience. Uh, so experience means you got to try and fail and try and fail. Um, so yeah, that that was just a random thought that I had. You know, so much of what I write, uh, whether it's in my column, in my book, but then I also really view Twitter as like just another outlet to write. Uh, I, I rarely write because I have things figured out. I write to try to figure things out. Yeah, that makes um, sense. yeah. Yeah, I, I shoot probably 30 to 60% on the things that I write. Um, so like I'm a human and a lot of it is just me working through things for myself and, and, and I'm lucky that other people are interested too. Yeah, is, is that partly what got you into your latest article on you know the the good is the enemy of great or like it's okay to be good and not great yeah i think so you know so in my in my performance coaching business where i work with uh, a handful of executives uh business professionals and, and just a few athletes what i realized is that there's a, a certain archetype for a temperament of someone that is really driven uh, you know, what you might call type A, very obsessive, very passionate. And for a long time in my coaching and in my own life, I thought that the, the thing to do was to take that drive and passion and just harness it and point it in the right directions. And now I'm coming to think that that's one end of the barbell, but there's this other end of the barbell, which is also cultivating the ability to just be content. Um, mm -hmm. and to just kind of accept where you are and be okay with that and be happy where you are, not necessarily pushing for the next thing. And it doesn't have to be 50, 50, but I think if it's just 100% drive, 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 progression, 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 better, 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 growth, 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 without any of this just acceptance of what is, um, yeah. I think that that's a recipe for, for long-term issues. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of does sell into some of the things that I've been wanting to ask you about. I, I noticed that in one of your articles, you referenced a couple meditation teachers that I'm familiar with. Um, one was John Kabat-Zinn, who's written yeah. um, a number of books. His 
his son is actually my meditation teacher uh, here in the Bay Area. And can you can you elaborate on your meditation teacher in the Bay Area? Like, where do you meditate with him? Yeah, so I, there's a weekly meditation uh, group that I go to, and then he has a Sunday meditation group in Berkeley, and I'll, I'm going to this Sunday. And then uh, every year he gives a. This is my favorite. This is my favorite. Have we not talked about this? Every year yeah. he gives a. He's on the board at a, a play at a meditation center called Spirit Rock, and. He has a week-long uh, sound retreat that I go to every year, and uh, Nate has I think dropped me off the last like yeah, few years. Yeah, few times. Uh, I drop him off at camp. Drop me off okay. at camp where I, I don't <laughs> talk to anybody for a week, and I come back a little weirder. That is mind blowing to me because I'm down with meditation. I'm down with the idea of, of sitting quietly for an hour. I've done long runs and rides where I'm really not talking to anyone, mm-hmm. but there's something about. Like, could you guys do that? Could you guys go for a seven-day silent retreat? Like, the silent times. thing is actually not. Have you been on a retreat before? Or do you, do you have a meditative practice, Brad? Yeah, I do. I, I have not been on a retreat. Um, it's actually funny. We should we should hook up this Sunday. So I I start I started getting serious about meditation about a year ago. Uh huh. And um, I started going to Will's Sunday Sangha. Sangha. Oh, in, nice. I was wondering in, if that was true. In Berkeley. Yeah. Um, but then my son was born, he's eight months old, and that yeah. was like a grenade that kind of erased all <laughs> optional things. So, yeah. um, that, you know, it's actually, uh, Will Cabot Zinn, your teacher, once said that having a, a baby is like having a Zen master live in with you. Right. I heard any, this. <laughs> any, any illusion of control that you think you have, you don't. Um, yeah. So my practice is much more home-based now, but uh, my folks are in town, Theo's grandparents, so I was actually hoping to go this Sunday night. So we should talk oh, about that. Awesome. Um, I have not, I've not yet done a silent retreat. I yeah. want to and I'm scared to. <laughs> well, he's having a one-day silent retreat, uh, or just regular retreat, not silent retreat, one day on parenting coming up in February. So anyhow, we won't go too deep down that path, but I just yeah. noticed it in like coming out in your writing in terms of like some of the ideas that, that, that I've learned from meditation. And um, we've talked about meditation on this, yeah. on this channel a lot. Um, I, it, I am a huge, huge proponent of it. Um, let's, well, let's, why don't we just you know, lean on Brad a little bit just to talk a little bit more about the impact, you know, the impact of it. Is it positive? Like this I know came out in peak performance. Um, what have you learned along the way in your research and writing about meditation for runners? Uh, we have um, a few runners on our channels who are chiming in that they haven't meditated yet. Um, they're kind of curious about it. But um, what, yeah, Brad, what have you learned that's, that's really beneficial there? So the first thing that I would say is that um, Thich Nhat Hanh, John Kabat-Zinn, Sharon Salzberg, some of these meditation teachers that I reference, they are like the original gangsters on performance. Um, they have this stuff figured out and they don't do it to necessarily perform better. They do it as a part of the spiritual practice. Mm. Um, but it just so happens that the the stuff is really wonderful for performance. Um, how I got into meditation is about a year ago. Um, I started suffering from some really bad anxiety. First time in my life. I've, I've never experienced anything like it. And just as a part of my recovery and treatment, um, meditation played played a part and what I, I learned because I have a very obsessive personality so I, I threw myself into meditation and really reading Buddhism and the philosophy behind meditation and so many of the current scientific evidence-based therapies not just for clinical anxiety but for cultivating mental strength and fortitude um, for example cognitive behavioral therapy CBT or acceptance mm-hmm. and commitment therapy uh, both of which I think every athlete should understand and practice. Those are just modern ways of talking about things that meditation teachers had figured out uh, centuries ago. Um, so, so can for I, me, it's can I just like push... going to the yeah, original yeah. part. Yeah, go ahead. That's, that's cool. So what could you elaborate a little bit on, on cognitive CBT? behavioral therapy, so CBT? I, I, I see somebody uh, like a, a therapist who does CBT uh, like three or four times a month. No kidding. Yeah. No big deal. He's like, like get with the times, Nate. Where you been? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, it, I'm it, picking up. I'm picking up dog poop outside yeah. with my. <laughs> so, so, so the basic premise of CBT, as I understand it, is that um, there's this constant loop with your cognition, so your thoughts, 
mm. uh, in your behaviors, and those lead to certain emotions. And we tend to um, fuse with our thoughts in our emotions. And thoughts and emotions are actually just like objective events. Like pain is not necessarily like you, you don't have to become the pain that you're feeling, whether it's emotional or physical. If you have um, a terrible thought, like you're not the thought, like you don't have to repress it and push it away. It can just be there like a cloud floating by in the sky. And all this sounds like intellectually really easy when you're having like really negative thoughts or bad emotional pain, or for this audience, if you're in a race and like you start to have really bad physical pain, it's, sounds nice to be like, oh, I'm not my pain. I'll just kind of observe it and disconnect myself from it. Um, no. It's hard to do. It's an ongoing practice. But the premise of CBT is to develop some, some tools and some skills to, to let you create some space between your experience of yourself mm -hmm. and then all the thoughts, feelings, emotions that come up uh, throughout a day. Hmm. Yeah. The, if anybody is, is watching this and wondering like, hey, like maybe I should, I'd like to try out some of these thoughts or try meditation, the two apps that I've had, uh, I've been a big fan of are, and I'd be curious, Brad, to see if you, you had uh, used, used anything else outside of um, studying with Will, but I, I used Headspace initially, which was, was a great introduction. I used it for a while, and then I think you still... I'm still on Headspace. Still use it. And then there's a new app that came out that is from a guy that I really, really like, uh, Sam Harris, and the app is called Waking Up. I believe it's on iOS. I'm not sure if it's on Android yet. Yeah. But uh, I've been, I just used it this morning. Actually, it's it's phenomenal. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a question here that I feels very apt and, and poignant here. Uh, GDK Mouse uh, says, "I've tried meditation before and it didn't seem to work." Oh, I love this one. Yeah. What would you say to that, Brad? If meditation is not working, it's always working. Um, so this, this is something, know, this is a big, this is a big stumbling block for many beginners. And I went, I, I stumbled upon this all the time and sometimes I still do. So when I first started meditating, I thought that there was a point to it. And, um, for a goal driven person, you want everything to have a point. So I thought that meditation would make me calm and would clear my mind. And what I actually found is that it did the exact opposite. Um, <laughs> when I, I know I, I can relate to that. When I sat in silence, especially when I was experiencing bad anxiety, the anxiety just got worse and 20 minutes in my head was awful. Um, and I thought, oh man, like I'm doing this wrong. Like I can't get it right. And uh, my therapist at the time said, no, like you're doing it exactly right. Just like do it every single day for three months and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And by the third month, I still wasn't getting into like a Zen flow state by any state. Um, or excuse me, like, like by, by no means. Uh, but this interesting thing started to happen, which is I would still have self-talk in my mind that wasn't always great, but I felt like there was some space between me and the self-talk. Mm. And that's when I'm like, oh, like this is kind of working. Uh, and then for me, it was after about six months of sitting for between 20 and 40 minutes every day uh, that I finally experienced what I would call like, very um, calm, relaxing, whole, connected state. Uh, and then that became a problem because then I started craving that state. And I'm like, oh, I got to get that every time I sit down to meditate. Oh, wow. um, and then, of course, you never get that. So I think the point of meditation is just to really force, at least my experience of it, is a forcing of you to get in touch with how your mind body operates and to really like viscerally learn impermanence. That like feelings come and go, good come and go, pain comes and goes. Um, another notable meditation experience that I had um, was I had a really bad itch on my face, and I was able to just watch the itch like crescendo, mm. get like really really itchy, and then die down without scratching it. And from a running standpoint, that's like one of the most important skills in the world because that is that itch is like wanting to slow down at mile 18 of a marathon. And right. it's just like a transient thing and scratching that itch is slowing down or freaking out or negative self-talk like, oh shit, like my hamstring's bad, my hamstring's bad. Yeah. But yeah. you can just let that itch kind of crescendo, often it just goes away. And obviously that's true in so many instances yeah. of life. I feel like... I don't know, Craig, I'm like, curious your take because you like you have so much more experience. I feel kind of dumb talking about meditation. No, I'm not at all. I, I'm just while. smiling because you know, one of the things about meditation is that it's it's something that's happening internal. So it's so hard to figure out like 
is this just a question you had like is this the experience I'm supposed to be having or it doesn't seem like it's working and to hear you talk about it I had very similar experiences like the yeah. itching thing I remember I'd come home I'd shower and then I'd have water trickling down my ear and it would it would just itch my ear and it was just infuriating for a while and then I realized after a while that like it just you know if if I just focus on it or just let it be there it goes away and the thing for me was actually a cramp like you know runners have yeah. all had cramps before right and it's this you know you might wake up at night have a cramp in your your you know calf or your hamstring whatever it is and I was sitting on a meditation cushion and in the middle of this meditation hall and I had a cramp in my in my calf and it was excruciating and it was so crazy to watch it kind of come and then it just dissipated it doesn't you know like the thought I had before is that if I don't stretch out my leg something bad is yeah. going to happen or you're this, like resisting it yeah this will be this way until I stretch it. it out and the truth was actually that it went away quicker yeah by just like letting it be it, it, it yeah it, it's funny to hear you talk about it because I've had very similar take that electrolytes I'm just gonna watch my cramps yeah. go away <laughs> And that's the other important thing from a performance standpoint is yeah. meditation is not just sitting and letting things happen. Like sometimes you really are cramping and you ought to stretch or eat. Sometimes right. you really should slow down or you're going to blow up. I think what meditation does is it creates space for you to have a more um, thoughtful, considered rea uh, uh, excuse me, response than mm -hmm. just reacting to everything. Yeah. So yeah, maybe I, the I think it, is like you're you're you have some kind of physical or emotional pain, uh -huh, and we're yeah. so accustomed yeah. to just like scratching the itch immediately. Right. And I think right. what meditation has helped me do is realize that the itch can be there for a little, and I can yep. investigate it and kind of be curious about it, and then yeah. decide whether yeah. or not to scratch it. I, totally. I really couldn't agree more. Let's, really, really great. Let's take a quick pause to um, highlight this week's giveaway. Uh, Brad is generous enough to give away two copies of his Peak Performance book. I would give you, uh, show you an example of it. Oh, he's got it. There we go. There we go. But I have it on my Kindle. Doesn't look as impressive on there. Um, I really enjoyed reading that, Brad. After I met you last fall, I think I downloaded and, and started reading it in, uh, over the winter. Um, so to enter guys, you can hit that Gleam link in the YouTube description. Yeah. Um, if you're a Twitter person, uh, Brad posts great stuff on Twitter. Um, check that out. Also have some links to his website where he's posted some of his like more top, popular top, top blog articles. Posts and stuff, yeah. Really, really good stuff. Um, so go ahead and check those things out. Enter and you might be one of the winners. And I, I just wanted to go back to this whole thing because uh, almost everybody who tries meditation or tries some of these things that are like focusing on the internal side of, um, of our yeah. experience. The idea that it doesn't work, um, it's because it, there's no Well, there's an expectation that it's supposed to, it's, we're supposed to immediately be calm. Like yeah. this idea, like you were saying earlier, Brad, where it's like, it, it's at first you're becoming aware of how fucking crazy this shit is up here. And, yep. and it's scary. We yeah. realize how frenetic, um, our brains are these days. Yeah, um, and I think it's it also kind of freeing. Down. It's also it kind is. of freeing because you learn that like one of the first things that I learned is like, wow, like thoughts like think themselves. Like right. Yeah. So then like you have like negative self talk. It's no longer like me. It's like oh, like that's just a thought, um, and I get to choose if I want to engage in it. Again, yeah. talking about this, like I have it figured out. I don't like this is an yeah. ongoing yeah. practice. I think I've yeah. gotten a little bit better. Um, so yeah, I I think that it I think. It works. I encourage folks, and you know, without getting like too dogmatic, because a huge part of like meditation in Buddhism is that there is no dogma. Um, yeah. I really learned more about performance recently from reading like older, wise meditation teachers than any book in like the self-help performance aisle. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, now, you you recently just did. I think I read a Spring article, um, and you were referencing Eliot Kipchoge a little bit and his viewpoint towards running. I kind of wanted to turn this more towards the run performance standpoint. You know, we get runners on our channel all the time who want to qualify for the Boston Marathon. They want to go under a certain either four hours or three and a half hours or three hours. And you can start to see the athletes go in a place that's like not a healthy space when they start pushing on that, that time area too much. Um, what did you gather from Elliot Kipchoge's mindset in terms of you know, did he even care about going after, say, like the world record in Berlin, or, or was it about something else for him? And, and what could we learn from that? 
Yeah, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, and I think it's something that is also uh, an ongoing practice. So it's a concept and the concept sounds like, oh, that makes sense, it's easy, but I think there are concrete things to do to practice this. Um, so I think that someone like Eliud Kipchoge, what makes him so special is that he is really, really cares and really, really passionate about running. Mm -hmm. He is not super stuck on his performance. So what Kipchoge wants to do is love running and become better as a runner. He does not like want to set PRs. He like that, that all comes as a byproduct of his love for running. And yeah. I think something that happens to lots of lots of people, both elites as well as just amateurs, is we start off with an activity like running and we love the sport. And then we start to get some good results. And yeah. then our motivation yeah. um, very subtly shifts. And suddenly the thing that we're actually passionate about is the result, not the activity. And, and there's this external pressure on us. Yeah. Line. And then there's an external pressure and even an internal pressure, like to perform, to perform, to perform versus just like the joy of the thing itself. And right. I think right. I've never met anyone that is a hundred percent internally motivated. Just, they love the thing. I mean, we're humans. Like when you perform well, you're going to feel good. We've got neurochemicals yeah. that yeah. make us feel that way. I do think it's important to try to make sure that at least 51% of your motivation comes from you loving the thing that you do. And I get this all the time, right? Like my, my job is literally like, I can only write if I get external validation. If people don't buy my books, if people don't read my articles, I can't make a living writing. Um, so I live with this every day, not so much as an athlete standpoint, but, but just professionally. And it's hard because like if my book's a bestseller, of course I feel great. Uh, if I write an article that flops, of course I feel crappy. But I really try to, to, again, to practice this notion of making sure that what I actually like is the writing, not mm. so much the reaction to the writing. Yeah. You know, we, we deal with the same thing on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. You know, like we've had yeah. a few videos that have really taken off, that have grown it, and we're like, we got to make the next, you know, big thing. It just puts you in a weird space when, mm -hmm. you, when you go there. So I, I try not to. Yeah, and, and in the end, I think, you know, one of the reasons that, that, I mean, for me, that this, you know, our work feels different than some of the work I did in the tech industry before mm. was just that, like, you know, we create a lot of content and we are both the consumers of the content and we enjoy putting it yeah. out there. And yeah. it makes a huge difference. I mean, uh, from our experience of the company and I think from the result that we put out, it, it, it changes it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I think so. I think another, so, so there's that. And then, um, something else that, that I know that I abide by, um, and this is like part of the practice of doing this is if you have a really good result. So let's say like you have a video that goes viral or you crush a workout or you marathon PR or you qualify for Kona, whatever it is. Yep. Um, I give myself like 24 to 48 hours to be really excited. Like the dopamine is going off in my brain. I'm like, oh, that's seller. This is great. Let's drink. Let's feel like the fucking man for a day or two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I force myself, and it can feel like forcing myself because you, you still want to kind of sit and bask in the glory and you're updating Twitter and whatever it is. But I force myself to like turn off all the devices and go to my coffee shop and write. And there's just something about getting back to the work that is so humbling because even after my book became a bestseller, like looking at the blank page, is no easier like right. it's still really freaking hard and then eventually i get into groove and i'm like i totally forget about the bestseller i forget about all that and it's like wow i really love to write yeah, and i think yeah. the, same, the same thing holds true for a disappointment um so after something goes poorly like you shouldn't repress the sadness like you should mourn it and you should be sad if you care about something that goes poorly but limit yourself to 48 hours and then again it's going to feel like forcing yourself because you're going to want to just kind of like bask in in the shit but like you just force yourself to go back to the thing itself. And yeah. then like there, there's just something about getting back to the work that humbles you and yeah. very quickly reminds you that actually I like the work or right. if you don't like the work, then like you should do some soul searching. It's like, wow, like yeah. do I really want to be in this cycle of like needing some external like validation hit of dopamine to be happy? Or can I find something else that I do that like the thing itself makes me pretty happy? 
Uh, and in our yeah. culture today where people share every single race result, where there's Twitter followers, where there's athletes, where you got to qualify for this, qualify for that. It's like all the forces in society push you towards the external end of things, but the healthy thing is the internal. So you, like, you really have right. to swim upstream right. on some of this stuff. Yeah, you really do. So I wanted to talk about your your marathon bid last fall because uh, when we were meeting, you were doing one of your like key runs to go under three hours, um, and I I know that when you raced, I think you were like so close. I missed it. I missed it. And really this is a right prime on example. The edge. I, this is this is like such a nice segue from what we were just talking about. Um, so I went three oh three on a course that measured um, a little under a half mile long. Um, okay. And it wasn't just like my watch, it was like everyone yeah. after the race was like looking at each other. Uh, but I did the math and I probably would have gone like 301, so I wouldn't have broken three anyways. Right. Um, and then I realized that I cared a little bit too much about that external benchmark. Uh, so I haven't run competitively since. Uh, that was my 10th yeah. marathon. And I felt like I was really fighting against my body to do it. So I played as a decent football player growing up. Um, and like now you can see like I'm built like a football player and running is like, I constantly feel like I'm hungry. I'm too, like for me at 5'11 to get under 165 pounds is like a Herculean effort. And yeah. um, after that race, I realized like, wow, like this is not that fun anymore. It seems like what I really care about is this arbitrary number, not so much running. Yeah. Uh, I knew that my son was about to be born, and yeah. running like just has a way of sapping me. That was the last time I ran competitively. Since then, I've been in the weight yeah. room four days a week, um, and like I'm just doing it because that's what's fun right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, I missed it. I missed it by like three minutes on that course, but a minute honestly. Totally. So I wanted to just like, you know, go a little into like what, you know, because you're just sort of fresh off of writing peak performance. And it's probably this cool opportunity to apply a lot of these concepts to your training. So I'm just curious to, you know, hear you comment on, you know, what were some things you tried in your training that were really successful? Um, you kind of already hit on this a little bit, but like, what were things if you were to go and do that again, hit rewind, what would you do differently going into that three hour? Because we have so many runners on our channel. Yeah. Who, who feel this way and they're in the middle of it right now, they might be training, uh, running New York in two weeks yeah. uh, or CIM in December, trying to go yeah. for that, that time. The things that worked, um, I think, are sleep. So unless you're sleeping over 10 hours a night and waking up feeling very sad and hopeless, like more sleep is always better, right? Like mm -hmm. there's, there's a point where like, just like nonstop sleep can be a sign of depression if it's like paired with those low moods. But if it's not paired with low moods, like it's sleep, sleep, sleep. I'd even say 11 hours if you're training hard is great. Um, so the more that you can sleep, the better. Uh, I think that nutrition is something that um, is just more important than I thought. Uh, and, and again, this is like a fine line between getting like a little bit too obsessive if you're an amateur, but really trying to like crush a goal is just some stuff around like timing of nutrition. So really getting pretty dialed in about like timing my carbs after workouts and then the rest of the day focusing on fats and protein. To really get lean and to train my body to like carbohydrates are paired with exercise. Um, so I think that, that that was something that was helpful. Uh, from a, a psychological standpoint, I wasn't meditating then. Uh, I like my head wasn't in a great spot. So I think like that's something that I probably would have done different. Um, something else I would have done different is I would have stopped one rep short more often. Mm. Uh, so on an eight by 800 workout, like I was coming through at like 250 rather yeah. than trying to crush that last rep at 246, simply because right. I was insecure and I wanted to prove to myself that I'm fast. I would have just run at 250 and it would have been like yeah. an eight out of 10 versus a 10 out of 10, because I think what I probably did was ran a few too many hard workouts and left my race in those workouts. Mm. Um, that's such an think, like, important it, point. That, to that me, such a big to me that's about having the confidence to hold back because the only reason I needed to run that 246 or maybe I was running mile repeats and instead of running them at 605, I felt the need to get under six for the last one. That's simply like to prove to myself like, oh, like you're going to do it. But what I'm actually doing is like I'm leaving my best 
effort out in some of those key workouts. Amateurs yeah. are almost so. I just based on my my experience working with people and just being in the the running and like weightlifting, just the athletic community um, here in the Bay Area at least. But this is probably a global thing. I think amateurs never really overtrain. It's really, really hard to actually overtrain yourself into like physical illness, but almost always still train just a little bit too hard, and it's because of insecurity. Um, so it's yeah. like the need yeah. to prove to yourself that you can do it versus just like just having restraint um, and save it for race day. Um, yeah. So that notion of kind of stopping one rep, one, one rep short and just being a little bit more consistent with like eight out of ten efforts instead of feeling the need to have a ten out of ten effort, um, I would have done different. I probably did way too much training alone, uh, mm. but this is tough, right? Like I work a job, my wife was pregnant. Uh, when, at least for me, like trying to get under three, I was maybe too much of a slave to my schedule. So it's like, oh, if my buddy is doing miles and I'm doing 800, like, nope, got to do my own workout. Um, yeah. Right. And uh, in the weight room now, like it's just a community at the gym. And like, there's just, and we write about this a lot in the book, Steve and I, my co-author of it. Like, there's a huge bonus to training in a community. Uh, and I think that if I would have been a little bit less obsessive about specific workouts, but taking more opportunities to train in a group, I probably would have run faster, and I certainly would have had more fun. Interesting. You know, that it's, it's so contrary to the advice that we've heard, you know, in every gym, in every coaching session where it's like, you know, one more rep or like, you know, last – this is your yeah. last one, like give it, leave it all on the track or, you know, that, that type of thinking. And it, it really is kind of counterintuitive yeah. from that mindset. Yeah. And I think it's, I, so here's like a really practical tip for listeners. And again, this stuff is, this stuff is hard to practice. Like I don't shoot hundred percent on this, but if you're feeling the urge to like crush that last rep or like add a mile to your long run or add another uh, 800 to your speed workout, right? pause and ask yourself, why am I doing this? And if the answer is like to prove to myself that like, or like to get that little extra bit of fitness, like don't do it. Um, just like, don't tell yourself like, this is only going to hurt me. Um, yeah. And, and the I, idea I, there being that, that through consistency of having like many, many more workouts with less a hit on your body, your, your ultimate performance will be yeah. higher. You, totally. I the, just, more, the, the more really successful athletes I talk to, even amateurs, like our common friend Mario Fraioli talks about this a lot, like you should very, very, very rarely be anywhere near a 10 out of 10. In yeah. Right. Right. We uh, can you decline that. Oh, hold on one second. We have 10 out of 10 for race day. Totally. Um, sorry, Brad, we, we lost your sound for a quick second. One second. Oh, hold on. Hold up. All right, hold on. We're back. We're going to get Brad back in just a second. I. There we go. You're back. There you go. Is that better? Um, so, Brad, you, you posted, this was a, another a quote from your article, um, it's it's good to it's okay to be good and not great. Um, research shows that sustainable progress in everything from diet to fitness to creativity isn't about being consistently great. It's about being great at being consistent. It's about being good enough over and over again. And really, what I'm hearing you from saying is like we have to be okay with stopping at the good enough part yep. in those workouts. Yep. And, and in everything, in relationships, in parenting, in, work, like in your day job if you're not a pro athlete. Uh, yeah, and, and I think you're a lot happier if you stop it good enough, too, because like you remove this anxiety of always needing like more, 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 better, better, better. Yeah, no kidding. Um, oh, amazing. What, a, what, a, what an experience. Do you think you'll, you'll come back to running at some point, or we got to still let that kind of lay for a little while? I think it's going to lay for a bit. It's, it's interesting. I, I'm so envious of people um, that have a running background because they can, like, not run for 10 years, and then their first marathon back, they go, like, 255. Yeah. And I yeah. feel like that's me in the weight room. Um, so, like, I can come back into the weight room, and after six months, like, I'm almost as strong as I was when I was being recruited to play college football. 
And there's just right, something right. that like feels nice about like, oh, like this, like this is what my, and not from, I, I sound like such a hypocrite, not from an external validation standpoint, just like, this is what my body wants. Um, and, and my body wants to be a little bit bigger and it, 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 my body wants to be explosive for between 10 and 40 seconds. Uh, yeah. and that's very different than running. Um, I still spend a lot of time hiking. So I've got like one of the child carrying packs that I put Theo in. So I try to get out, uh, at least, at least once, if not twice a week for like a good day hike with him and my wife, cause, mm -hmm. um, I love nature. I do think that there's something about aerobic exercise that just like you can't get in the gym. Uh, so by no means am I like completely shoving off, like going into total meathead mode. Um, just, just not trying to run fast. You know, I, I had a, a similar experience. Um, I ran in college. I, I don't know if you know this, but I was on the same team as Steve Magnus, just separated by a few years at Rice. Oh, and, I know that. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, coming out of college, I raced a bunch, did like, you know, 10, 15 marathons, whatever it was, and we're in there. And, and eventually just kind of like, you know, I don't, I don't really want to do this anymore. And then I got injured, which is kind of like the whole saga of how I met Nate and, and then we started the run experience. But somewhere in there, I hadn't been running for a couple of years and I went into the weight room and started putting on weight and I was like, oh, this is like a different body. And I feel that, you know, it, it is the same thing of like, I'm just rediscovering now, um, you know, going out and running and putting in six, eight miles in the morning just just Enjoy because yeah with no yeah. no agenda no workout specific um i still do a lot of like mobility and stuff just to to take care of my body but it's it has really been amazing to rediscover just running for running and uh and i i can totally see like it, it could be anything it could be lifting it could be going back to running you know uh, yeah it sounds like you had the opposite experience of me like i'm getting back to my roots and lifting right the same right. thing like after when i finished school um after like two years, I'm just like, I don't like, I'm not doing this competitively. Like what's the point of like yeah. spending two hours in the right. weight room and I want to try right. something new running. And then I like yeah. really geeked out on running and now it's kind of back to my roots for a bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think I'll run again. You know what? Like my wife runs half marathons. I think Theo, like it'll be fun to run with him when he gets a little older, but I don't, I don't, I, I'm, I am okay. Now, like, I don't know if I'm ever going to run a sub three marathon and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So when I was getting ready for the show and doing a little research, uh, I couldn't really find you on Instagram. And I wanted to know what if were you, you are on Instagram. <laughs> what was I doing on Instagram? I wanted to know, um, you know, how you pick your battles on social media and what channels you you use and what you don't use and and why. I think there's a lot of pressure for, for all of us to be on all the channels all the time. Nate wants to commiserate uh, over his hate. His no, no, hate. don't salt the jar. Don't, like, you know, he doesn't know what's happening. I just... <laughs> you're like I just telegraphing wanted to... the past from, like, all the way down there. I just I'm wanted to hear... You need couples therapy. <laughs> I just, you know, business, business wife right here. <laughs> I just wanted to hear, you know, Brad, uh, you know, talk about... Uh, you know, how, how you uh, handle that. So I, I am just on Twitter. I, I have a Facebook account, um, that I use very shamelessly, uh, to promote like stories that I really care about or books. And yeah, that's it. I'm a shameless promoter on Facebook. I may be on there like once every two months, uh, yeah. just to shamelessly promote. And, um, that's part of the reason why I'm not on Facebook. Cause I think that's what Facebook's become. Um, a lot of shameless promotion of like my life, my friends, my happiness, the stuff that I do. Uh, and then I'm, I'm on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter. Um, I have a love hate relationship with Twitter, but the, there's more love than hate. So I stay on it. Um, <coughs> those are the only two platforms. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, and then the elephant in the room. <laughs> are you, What's did that? you, was, was Instagram ever something that you did for a little while and stopped or were you just like. Uh, I'm good on Twitter and I'm just, uh, decided not that I don't, I don't really need that. So I think my wife actually created an Instagram account for me. So she could like look at a LeBron James post during the basketball playoffs. So I, cause every once in a while I get emails from Instagram being like, we haven't heard from you ever. Um, yeah. and I quickly yeah. delete those. So I like, I might actually be on Instagram somewhere in the abyss. 
but I've, I've never logged into Instagram. Um, yeah. I've just yeah. never had an interest in it. And, and why? I don't take pictures. Um, mm. And like, I think for me, like that's Instagram fair. is like, take pictures and you want to share them, like that's a way to do it. But I just felt like I didn't need um, the pressure of another place to spend time, to post, to be judged, to um, get those dopamine hits. That like my, my hate relationship with Twitter is there are times when I realize that if I have a low mood, I'll post something on Twitter, and, and if it does well, like I feel a little bit better. And I don't think that's a healthy long-term behavior. Uh, the flip side is also true. There are times when like I write something that I think is going to do great, and like it doesn't, and then I get kind of sad even though like I still have this healthy kid, a wonderful wife, like why am I set? Like, so I think that um, just having another, like other places where that happens um, isn't good for my mental health. Yeah. And I think that everyone experiences this differently. Um, I do think to some degree, this is a ubiquitous thing uh, because these platforms are engineered that way. Like nothing is better for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram than people to go post when they're sad because people often experience sadness and that talk about like an addiction it's like oh instead of drinking instead of smoking like I'm gonna go on social media um, right. so that's the hate relationship the love relationship with it is I met my co-author Steve Magnus on Twitter and yeah, then really? on Twitter Nate oh, I met wow. you through Mario so if it wasn't for Twitter I probably wouldn't be here yeah um, I've got a lot of in-person friends like there's a lot of good ideas on Twitter so again, like it's easy to sit here and bash social media, um, but I think that there's also like a lot of good. Like we're having this conversation on social media. Are yeah. we getting like dopamine hits from thinking and sharing ideas? Of course, but are we also like engaging a community? Yeah. So like as long as the benefit is greater than the cost, I'm all for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I you know I think circling back to where we started with this is, you know, the balance of this with things that are driven more internally and I guess you could say meditatively where we're, we become better at turning these things on and off yeah because I think if yeah. the default switch is that they're just on all the time right yeah, and we it. have to we have to manually turn them off that's it yeah unfortunately and, and to not in, 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 in to not judge yourself to realize like this is a normal human condition like the worst thing that I can do in this context of like social media but again for the runners like I'm sure that this applies to like sharing workouts and Strava whatever is at first I just like was a robot. Then I gained awareness to realize like, oh, like I just got down because a tweet didn't do well. Someone in the audience might be, I just got down because like I didn't hit a workout goal that people that I thought like would make people happy. But then I started judging myself. I'm like, oh, like you're, you're, you're like bad for getting down. And that yeah. is like not healthy either. So it's like realize like these systems are designed like for this stuff to happen. So like when you slip up, it's like, oh, like interesting. Like I just like let my mood get determined by a tweet. That's dumb, but like I'm a human, I'm gonna get on with my day. Um, yeah. There's this Buddhist expression, don't let the arrow hit you twice, that has been really helpful for me. And what that means is like the first arrow is like realizing that like, oh, like I'm down and I shouldn't be. The second arrow is judging yourself for it. Same thing in a workout, like the first arrow is like maybe going too hard or yeah. getting injured yeah. because you went too hard or the opposite, not going hard enough. The second arrow is judging yourself for it. So like another like really good practice is like to focus on like when those first arrows hit, like try not to create a second arrow. That's so good. Well, I couldn't think of a better way to uh, bring this to a close. Yeah, yeah guys, one more just uh, quick pop in that about the, the Gleam Link. If you want to win one of Brad's books, hit the link below. Uh, we'll be doing the drawing next week, so if you're not watching this live, of course you can still enter. Um, Brad, first of all, thank you so much for, for taking the time with us. Um, just a wealth of knowledge about this stuff, and, and I hope we can continue to connect. Uh, maybe I'll see you on Sunday. I know, we'll have to do a little meditation session yeah. sometime. Go, yeah, go hiking, we'll, do it, that'll be great. We'll Sounds connect offline, and then um, I'd love to come back on the show. I can't say much about it, but uh, Steve and I have another book that's coming out early next year. Awesome. Uh, that is very much focused on topics like these and like a real deep dive that I think you guys and your audience um, are going to dig. So that'd be we'll awesome. Keep the conversation yeah. going. Great. Well, awesome. Well, guys, yeah. keep a lookout for, uh, for Perfect. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. Bye. Oh, that was so great. All right. Yeah. Ooh.
guys Perfect. um thank um, you so much for tuning in guys um you yeah. know that we we really appreciate having people like brad on because yeah. it brings a new perspective and i just love the topic i mean uh i think it's not often that we have the kind of airtime to talk about you know the internal stuff and how it how it affects our external world and and from a performance standpoint from a health standpoint um we will be on same time next week yeah we will. Oh, actually, no. What? Special. Less. We're going to be in New York. We're going to be in New York next week, so we'll be uh, on the ground. Uh, hopefully, meeting you guys, and we'll have a show from. I'm trying from New York. to uh, potentially wrangle Mario to to come in and give us a live breakdown awesome. of the uh, competitive fields for New York. Oh, that'd be cool. It'd be kind of fun to, okay. to hear of those guys what's happening. Um, and uh, we got to do the drawing from last. Did you do a drawing? Oh, from last oh, week? I did. I did. This is for uh, the health nutrition. It is. Go for it. We'll pull that up here. And, uh, and then we'll send you guys on your way. So not that one, this one. So last, so yeah, okay. So you guys did a giveaway. A giveaway for nutrition consultation. All right, I like that. Let's see, one winner gets a session with Elizabeth. Lucky duck. Let's see it. All right, we have Michael Hartwig from Hawthorne, Australia. All right, Michael, congratulations. Michael, good job. Good job. And uh, if you're on. Uh, just email us, and if not, we're gonna email you, and we'll get you set up with Elizabeth. We'll do it. Sounds good. Guys, thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you guys again next week. Hang on, we have a new outro. Check this out. Good to be.